So thank you all so much for coming out on, your, on this beautiful Saturday. Um, and it's just such an honor to be invited and honored to talk to all of you about something that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I am a paleoecologist. Uh, you might recognize those two words separately when you put them together. Uh, it's basically what it sounds like on the tin, right? So I do ecology, but over really long time scales. And on a good day, that sounds like mucking around with mammoth bones and going into permafrost caves in Siberia and living out the life of the Ice Age in my mind. On a bad day, it can feel like I'm reading a casualty list six and a half billion years long. Um, you know, everything from asteroids, you know, it's taking us through the story of Earth's biodiversity from its peaks to its valleys and back again. Um, I also know, you know, firsthand in this work what it means to lose a species, uh, what it means to an ecosystem to see its resilience unravel uh, because of rapid climate change or extinction. And these are lessons that I strive to apply to my work. Um, I, I'm very deeply rooted in the present, even though I spend a lot of time wandering around and thinking about the past. And I think that this matters because uh, the, ice, the last ice age is actually a really good analog for where we're headed into the near future. And um, actually a little bit of hopeful news, this is one of my favorite comics by Randall Monroe of XKCD. Um, the amount of climate change that we experienced at the end of the last ice age is pretty equivalent uh, to the climate change we're expecting in the future. And when he made this, uh, we were looking at something like four to five degrees Celsius of warming. And we're actually, we've ratcheted that back a little bit thanks to the work of people like you in this tent, right? And so this, this comic, which was published maybe a decade ago, actually needs to be revised a little bit. But we'll talk about that later. And so, you know, a couple of degrees Celsius uh, may not seem like a big deal to us. We may not notice that as we walk about in our day-to-day -day lives. But the Earth definitely notices. So Turtle Island 21,000 years ago, we would have been having this either under or hopefully on top of about a kilometer or two of ice. Um, so those are, you know, these are big swings from a global perspective. But that also means that ice age ecosystems can help us roadmap our way through the climate crisis. This is not a new experience for planet Earth, and we can use that information to help us understand what makes ecosystems more or less resilient and how our actions can be mimicking some of those processes. So how do we do this? Well, uh, I don't have a time machine or a TARDIS, those of you who are Doctor Who fans. Uh, and so we use forensic tools. So if you're familiar with shows like Bones or CSI, we're doing the same kinds of, of, of research, except instead of reconstructing crime scenes, we're reconstructing ecosystems from the past. And so we might use tools like ice cores or fossil charcoal or pollen grains taken out of sediments. Uh, we might work with the bone records. Um, and this work takes me all over the world from the Falkland Islands or Malvinas all the way up into the Arctic and points in between, including right here uh, in Dawnland. And the ecosystems that I work in would have looked something like this not that long ago, certainly not so long ago that the rest of our species today have forgotten some of these animals. Um, and pretty much everything you can see in this artistic rendering is now extinct through a combination of climate change and human hunting, uh, except for one species, which I'll come back to. And so, you know, at the end of the last ice age, Alaska was more diverse than the Serengeti is today in terms of large herbivores. And this is one of the big uh, areas of, of my research, how losing these large animals actually undermines our ecological resilience, and, and the legacies of that are still playing out today, which is why reintroducing herbivores um, and even using tools like restorative agriculture and sheep grazing can actually be a really powerful climate tool, just as a side note. Um, and so now, of course, the Arctic in many places looks closer to something like this, right? And so we're trying to understand how the loss of those large animals is undermining the Arctic's resilience. Um, and so it's questions like that that took me to, I'm going to start this talk with a story. Uh, questions like that took me to South Dakota to help with an excavation of Persistence Cave, which was this incredible fossil deposit that was discovered just full of the bones of these large Ice Age herbivores, including bison, which are another one of our amazing, resilient uh, Ice Age survivors. So I was not one of the people who went into the cave. Um, that was done by some of my colleagues. And so while they were going down and bringing up buckets of dirt 
and taking out large bones, and we were cataloging all of those. I was under a tent very much like this, with a little cafeteria lunch tray and some tweezers. Um, and I was sorting through all of the small material. And this was actually quite exciting for me. I usually work with plants, and so the novelty of pulling out tiny little snake vertebrae and little mouse toe bones just had captured my imagination. I just thought this was the coolest thing. Um, so, you know, little squirrel femurs and things um, that had been brought in by predators tens of thousands of years ago into this cave. And so while this is all happening, you know, the bison are still making their presence known around our little area. The, they roam freely through the park. We, the park service had put up a little tent for us, or, or sorry, a little fence for us. But when you look at a bison and you look at the fence, it doesn't, <laughs> I don't think that they cared. Um, so, you know, I would do my screen washing and then I'd go back into the tent and I'd, I'd pick away and get excited and I'd occasionally look up and a park ranger would show up and, and just be there in case something got a little too close, which always felt like I was the one intruding, so I didn't, I don't know. Um, that always felt a little weird to me. Um, so, you know, this story, it's a 100 degree day uh, inside a fence keeping the bison out and here I am, you know, feeling like I'm cosplaying as a scientist, which is funny because I am a scientist, but it's always fun to kind of get out of your wheelhouse. And I'm just picking away and putting tiny little bones and tiny little jars and labeling them and, and just really having the, the time of my life. And then they come down from the hill, from the cave, and it, with a big plastic Ziploc bag, and they say, oh, you know, Jacqueline, we're so sorry, but that field tape that, that you lent us, um, we found it in the cave. Something chewed it up. They unspooled 100 meters of field tape and chewed it up into little sections about this long and looked like they were trying to build a nest, maybe. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. You know, here's your $100 field tape. And, I, and so I, I still have it in the lab. And I said, OK, well, stuff happens. That's fine. And then I went to go get a drink of water because it was 100 degrees that day. And I was trying to stay hydrated. And my trusty Nalgene had been chewed through in the strap just the, the lid came loose. And I thought, well, that's weird. I didn't notice that earlier. The water bottle's been right by my ankle. Something must have come up and chewed on it while I was sitting here. And then I went back at the end of the day to my tent and took off my rattlesnake-proof boots and went to go put on my, my beloved Chacos to let my feet breathe. And something had chewed through all the straps of my Chacos, which I had foolishly left outside of the tent in the vestibule. And then um, the next morning, I was packing my bag to go back to the field site and saw, as I was filling my bladder for my camelback, something had chewed a hole in the bottom of my backpack and exposed all of my snacks and water and everything else. Uh, and I went to go put my boots on, my rattlesnake-proof boots, and something had chewed along every seam in the boots, just like chewed along the seams. And so everything, it's like the boots are deconstructed with incredible precision. Uh, and so it was very clear to me that within about 12 hours, something had eaten through all of my stuff, you know, hundreds of dollars of field gear. Um, oh, and here's a picture of me uh, sitting with my bag of chewed up field tape. And this is, you know, th these are not the kinds of mysteries that I set out to, to, to solve with science, um, but this was the mystery that was presented to me. And it became very clear that these were the culprits, right? <laughs> small mammals that were experiencing a massive boom in their population that summer because it had been unusually wet in that part of South Dakota for the last year. And, and I just had this moment that as an extinction scientist, I had been spending all of my time thinking about death and loss, and I was ignoring all of the biodiversity that was still here, right? So as I'm even sitting there fascinated, picking apart all of these samples and looking for these toe bones of mice and little squirrel and rabbit bones, all of these animals are systematically running around, asserting themselves and saying, we are still here, <laughs> right? We were, we were around then, but we're here now. And, and that was just this moment for me. It was like this, this profound moment where I really understood that everything outside, if you look around right now, every species that you see, every species you've seen since you woke up this morning, every species you've seen in your entire life is an Ice Age survivor, right? This is the biodiversity that we live among and that we are you know, tasked with doing our best to protect. And when I had focused so much on the loss, on what we had lost, um, 
I, I had really closed my eyes and my mind and my heart to what remains. And so, you know, in an image like this, yes, we no longer have the mammoths, uh, the arctic horses, the uh, short-faced bears, the arctic camels, and many of the other species, but the caribou are still with us, and the muskox are still with us. And I started to think about muskox a lot. I became very fixated on muskox um, when I was in Siberia, and came to, as I came to understand and learn more about them, um, you know, I've always been a woolly mammoth girl, but muskox are giving them a run for their money because they're incredibly, uh, in, and to me, very inspiring, right? They are uh, collective, they are resilient, they are matriarchal, um, so many things that I will go into. But I just wanted you to know, for me, what my journey was through this process of just fixating on death to the, to the point that I realized I was abrogating my responsibility to the living. And, you know, it's, it's easy to do that. It's easy to focus on loss, right? When we know, when we see pictures like this that came out just a couple of years ago from California with the wildfires, when the skies turn an apocalyptic orange, it's very easy to just be, to, to fall into despair, to focus on our grief and on our loss uh, to the point that we neglect what remains. Um, and it's true, climate change is real. It is bad, it is us, and the time to act was a long time ago. It's not now, but it's still now. Now is the second best time. And, you know, as a scientist, I was trained as a communicator to fight deniers, to fight the people saying climate change is not real. But if you look at the polling data, that is not the problem we are facing anymore. The deniers, or what the Yale Program on Climate Communication calls the dismissives, right? These are the people who who poo-poo the science of climate change, who actively work to undermine uh, climate consensus, they are a minority. And in recent years, they've dropped as low as single digits in terms of the, the population. And that's true in Maine as well, actually. You can look up county-level data on the, the YPCC website, and you can see what your neighbor's opinions are on climate change at a very granular level. What's interesting about this is that the majority of people in the US, which has a uniquely dysfunctional climate conversation, uh, the majority of people are either alarmed or concerned, right? Many are cautious. The, the disengaged tend to be people like the, um, you know, members of the working poor who are more immediately focused on other things, right? It's not that they don't care about climate change, it's just that they have other needs that are not being met in the immediate sense. The doubtful and the dismissives, um, dismissives we can't, change their minds. There's a lot of research on this, right? You can spend your entire life trying to argue with that cantankerous uncle, or in my case, my father, uh, and just not moving the needle at all. And so that's one individual, you know, that many of us might have been spending a lot of our time and our effort and our energy on, and those people are not going to change. Meanwhile, the majority of people in this country, it doesn't feel like it sometimes, but it's the majority of people in this country believe that climate change is real, and they are alarmed or concerned about that. Many of them still think it's something that's going to happen to other people far away or in the future, but that's changing. Um, so this is a, a tremendous opportunity to leverage a large body of people who are already on our side, but they just don't know what to do. They don't know what to do, right? And meanwhile, you know, the youth certainly don't need to be told that climate change is real. And if any, are any of you educators? Do you teach any, do we have any teachers in the room? Yeah, you've probably noticed this, that at some point we went from having to explain to our students what climate change was, and now they already know, right? Now the questions I get from my students are things like, will I grow up one day? Is there a reason to go to college? Will there be a world for me to grow up into? Can I have kids, right? will I live to be in my 30s? These are the kinds of questions that I'm getting. Five, 10 years ago, it was things like, is climate change real, right? So we have blown past one problem, which is convincing people that this is a problem, and now we have a new problem that we are not prepared for. We have not been trained for this problem, right? Which is to address the anxieties and the concerns of the alarmed and give them pathways to action that are meaningful, right? And that is a very different problem, and it's one that we have to rise to the challenge to extremely quickly. But before I go into how we can do that, I wanna talk a little bit about how we got here, because I think history is important, 
probably because I'm a paleoecologist, so I, I look at everything from a historical lens. And you could pick an arbitrary date as to when we first started as a scientific community raising the alarm about the climate crisis to our federal government. And here in the US, the scientific community has been concerned and bringing up those concerns about climate change, anthropogenic climate change, since I would say formally 1965. We often talk about um, Jim Hansen's 1988 testimony to Congress, but this 1965 report on restoring the quality of our environment, right? This predates Earth Day, this is incredible. This report outlines specifically that people are changing the atmosphere and that could have really negative consequences down the line. Uh, I was born in 1980, so this is me in 1981, um, at when our uh, CO2 levels were 339 parts per million. And I just wanted to put this in here, not because I think I have any role in this grand arc or narrative arc of uh, climate history, but just to provide some context about what it's been like. You know, I'm 42 and even I have grown, never, I've never experienced a normal climate in my life, right? I was already born when we were already over 100 parts per million above pre-industrial levels in terms of carbon dioxide, right? So I was seven years old when the IPCC was formed. Uh, the United Nations launched the IPCC in 1988 as a global uh, collective of governments uh, to assess the science every seven or so years and to roadmap what the future would look like. So the first of these was 1988. Um, and I'm going to give some special mention to the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 because even though it focused on, um, uh, so, so let me start over. The, the Kyoto Protocol was an international treaty that basically extended the 1992 uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so this basically committed all the state parties, the members of the UN, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the United States Senate refused to ratify that treaty. And this, for the first time, actually represented a shift in how our federal government talked about climate change. Up until 1997, this was a bipartisan issue that had widespread concern from across political parties. And those of you, some of you in the audience may remember that, that there was a marked shift, right? And so this represents the beginning, the real beginning of fossil fuel intervention, right, in, in climate action and government collusion. We won't say in action, we'll say government collusion because the government to this day still provides fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, 2004, 2006, we get a couple of really important movies that come out and really shift the public consciousness. Now you might be thinking, yeah, I know about An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore's documentary, but why did you put this blockbuster science fiction film up from 2004 about you know, a, an ice age uh, that emerges quite abruptly? And that is because the Yale Program on Climate Communication did research on this and they found that an inconvenient truth did, was not as effective as the day after tomorrow in terms of shifting public consciousness about climate change. This fictional film starring Dennis Quaid did more to raise public belief and awareness of climate change than Al Gore's famous documentary. Which might sound funny, but if you went to any of the climate storytelling workshops yesterday, I bet you learned about the importance of story and narrative, right? Highly, heavily effective. So take that lesson. And those of you who are artists, filmmakers, writers, poets, musicians, you have an incredibly important role to play. You are a thousand times more effective than anything that I could possibly do at changing public perception and activating and motivating people in the climate crisis. So we need to be having more conversations about that. Um, so the next thing that happens as uh, all the stuff that scientists had been saying for decades started happening, uh, we saw the 10 hottest years on record globally from, 20, from 2000 to 2019. So nine of the hottest years ever recorded were in that decade. Uh, and CO2 levels continued to rise as our emissions continued. And then there's a sea change. 2018 really represents a watershed year for a few reasons. Now, the first of these is a paper uh, that you might have read. It's Jim Bendel's Deep Adaptation Map for Navigating Climate Tragedy. And a little backstory for this paper, it, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with it, it basically presupposes that 
there will be a fundamental collapse based on Im impending abrupt climate disruptions. So there's no averting complete societal collapse. And this paper was actually rejected from peer review. It was published as a white paper and has been widely influential. You could say it's really reached iconic status in a lot of communities. But it has problems. It was widely criticized by scientists at the time, folks like Michael Mann and Gavin Schmidt, who called it pseudoscientific, and warned that the doomist framing, right, that there is inevitable climate collapse that's imminent, could lead us down the same path as climate denial. So they were really the first to raise the alarm that a certainty of imminent collapse could become a discourse of climate delay, right? If we don't believe we can do anything, we will do worse than nothing, right? To paraphrase Margaret Atwood. It was also, this paper was also criticized by a number of people in the climate justice movement because the framework itself lacks justice. It fails to account for the fact that climate harms were already here. They were affecting frontline marginalized community, the communities the first and the most, and that effectively deciding to give up on those people uh, is tantamount to genocide, right? And that's unacceptable. And so, uh, Bendel has since updated some of the, uh, this framework. There was sort of a 2.0 version, but really the cat was out of the bag in terms of really convincing a lot of folks that nothing we could do would be able to forestall the impacts of climate change and that we were approaching levels of go find a bunker, take care of you and yours. This is going to be bad. So you can see how that might be a problem. So Extinction Rebellion, uh, begins their protests in May. They start gaining traction uh, nationally and internationally by October and November in London and then spreading worldwide. So we start to see this upswell of a real uh, visible grassroots climate movement, which is not to say that this has not been going on for decades, right? People had been fighting uh, or, or there had been a, a climate movement going on for many decades. And in fact, Pacific Islander nations had been raising many of these concerns for decades, which went largely unreported, right? They were getting very little support from the global community. So the Global South had already been raising many of these alarms, um, but it just wasn't making headlines. Uh, in September, it's wild to think it was only September of 2018, but Greta Thunberg starts her weekly uh, Friday climate strikes, which start to gain international attention by around October and November. So you can see it's all converging. Uh, these continue on to 2019 and still to today. And then we get the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees, which was reported here with this framing in The Guardian. Their translation was that we have 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe. And I want to take a moment to get a little granular and nerdy about what this is and where 1.5 came from, because it's something we hear a lot about. It's something we talk a lot about. And I think that confusion around the 1.5 degrees target uh, feeds into some of the binary thinking we have about climate change as a pass-fail problem. So it's important to remember that by the time this came out, we have already warmed 1.2 degrees, which means we're given according to this framework, 10 years to prevent, one point, or to, to prevent 0.3 degrees of warming. And so to do that, we essentially have to cut our emissions in half within that 10 year time frame, and all the way to net zero within 20 years. So around the time of, of the 2030 number here. And so, you know, that's just the brutal math of 1.5 degrees. When you don't give yourself a whole lot of time to, and you've already warmed you know, most of the way towards that target, you don't have a, a, a lot of opportunity to make that happen. And so around 2015, um, the scientific community was really focused around you know, keeping well below, well below two, two degrees Celsius. And so they had a, a series of Earth system models that were tasked with trying to find out what we had to do to prevent passing that 1.5 degrees threshold. And almost universally, those models said, we can't do it. It's not possible. And it's not that it's not possible because of science, right? The biggest uncertainty in climate projections comes from people. Are we going to have a global pandemic? Are we going to have a war in Ukraine uh, over fossil fuels? Are we going to uh, share our technologies with China or are our relationships with China going to break apart, right? These are the kinds of uncertainties that have the biggest influence on what our climate futures look like. 
it's much less than things like, will this ice sheet in Antarctica break off or not, right? And so the Earth system models can only project what the emission scenarios or pathways they're given call for, right? So it's a range of scenarios that are really informed guesstimates by social scientists about what we're going to do on the ground or what the people in power are going to do. So the Earth system scientists said, I don't see how we're gonna do this. The only way we can really make this target is if we blow past it uh, in the next 20 or 30 years and then spend the last decades of, you know, until 2100, just doing carbon capture and storage, which by the way, according to our math, requires taking two to three times the land area of India and devoting that to carbon capture and storage, which think about the social justice implications of that. And so at the time they said, let's just keep it to two degrees or under, like well below, we, you know, gives, gives us a little wiggle room. And so Paris Agreement discussions at that time were all around keeping well below two degrees. And very understandably, the Pacific Islander nation said, hold up at two degrees. You know, we've been saying this for a long time, but at two degrees, we're underwater. It's not acceptable. And the problem is it was already too late, right? And so the Paris Agreement said, okay, 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 fine. We'll say 1.5, you know, because we recognize and respect that two degrees is too much, knowing that that wasn't possible. And then that became translated to the global community as we have 10 years to limit a climate change catastrophe because within 10 years we've committed to that 1.5 degrees. And so that becomes interpreted by the global community and many people as a threshold, right? A doorway we pass through, at which point it's game over, right? You see words like game over. You see things like a literal doomsday clock that is ticking down second to second, right? Which reflects a growing sense of the climate crisis as a binary, right? We either survive or we die. And that starts to contribute to this emerging sense of doomism, right? This feeling that we are doomed. Because if we, we keep seeing inaction, we keep seeing emissions go up, we know that this clock is ticking down. We know the timeline is moving forward and we're not getting there. Therefore, we need to prepare for imminent collapse. And so we see the rise of this concept of climate doomism, which really takes off post-2018. And it's around that time that I start to hear questions like, will I grow up one day? Instead of, what can I do when it comes to the climate crisis, right? Will there be a world for me in the future? And so in her recent uh, article in the conversation, Anastasia Denisova said, she defines climate doomism as the view that humanity has lost the climate battle and we feel nothing but helplessness and anxiety about it. I have stopped using the term doomism actually. I, I tend to move towards defeatism because people sometimes hear doomism and they think that what you're saying is you're not allowed to have feelings about the climate crisis, which is not true. These feelings are natural, right? Anxiety, depression, I've got them. Like, it's a normal response emotionally to the dysfunction and the lack of action by our, our leadership. But I think of doomism and defeatism, which I prefer, as a certainty. And as Rebecca Solnit tells us, Doomism, defeatism, despair, they rely on a certainty about an uncertain future. And, they, and she puts those in the same category as optimism, the idea that someone's gonna fix it for you, right? Optimism also is a certainty that everything is going to be okay. Both of them require no action on my part. If I'm optimistic that the climate crisis will be solved, I don't need to work on it. Someone's got that, we're good. I'm just gonna focus on whatever other thing I'm doing. Similarly, if I don't believe we can address this, I'm also going to shut down. And there's a growing amount of psychological literature, social science literature on this phenomenon. And it is associated with inaction, right? If people are immobilized by their grief and despair, they believe that nothing can be done. And what's worse, they go around and telling everyone else that. You know, you can't, we can't do this, we can't, we can't fix this, we're screwed, you know, go get your bunker or just go consume relentlessly, have fun, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow we die, right? And so this is, this is the narrative that we have to fight. This is the narrative that we are tasked with addressing if we want to make change. And uh, in a really wonderful article um, by Lamb and others, uh, they talk about doomism and despair as a discourse of climate delay that is just as impactful as denialism, right? 
Because if what you're doing is kicking the problem of climate change down the road, you are causing more harm. It doesn't matter whether it's because you believe that it, nothing we do will matter, or if you believe that we have no problem to address in the first place. The outcome is the same, right? And so one of the, if, if you could just take one thing away from this weekend, I would ask that you challenge yourself to recognize that the climate crisis is not pass-fail. And every fraction of a degree matters. Every fraction of a degree will save millions of lives. And that will always be true. That will be true at 1.5. That will be true if we hit two or three or God help us four, right? We don't want those futures, but anything we can do to prevent more warming prevents more harm. A no harm scenario was never possible because harm has already happened. Just because some of us are waking up to it for the first time does not mean that frontline communities, indigenous communities, people in the global south have not been feeling these impacts the first and the most and warning us for decades, right? We don't get to give up just because it starts to affect us now. And so we, thanks. So the challenge we have, for those of you who do communication, is that scaring people tends not to work. Which isn't to say we should sugarcoat things, but just fear appeals by themselves, and there's a broad literature out there on everything from smoking, you know, what, what caused people to stop smoking was not scaring them about lung cancer, it was telling them it wasn't cool. I mean, that's literally it. Uh, we know that when people are afraid, they, you know, they shut down, they put up walls. And that's true with the climate crisis. If you want to motivate people, you still tell them the truth, but you have to give them a roadmap to action. It's a yes and, right? Yes, the climate crisis is bad, and here's what you can do about it, right? I invite you to join me. Um, so I just wanted to make a quick, uh, I, missed, I missed a slide there, sorry. Um, but I wanted to make a quick uh, plug for um, the Montreal Protocol, which, uh, was this wonderful example. Spend some time researching how that came about. It was a combination of both grassroots activism, but also corporate leadership, which is kind of weird. Basically, DuPont read the room and said, we need to stop using these CFCs, and they just divested of that themselves for market reasons. And then a bunch of other companies decided to do the same thing. But to get the law passed, to get it ratified, there was a tremendous global grassroots letter writing campaign that you never hear about that was integral to getting the Montreal Protocol ratified by the United States. And for the yeah, for the ozone layer. And that was when? Uh, oh gosh, 1997, five, seven? 90s. Sorry, this is this was all on the slide that I accidentally deleted. Um, and so what's really cool about this though is that has anyone ever said to you that there's a common misconception that the hole in the ozone layer has something to do with climate? Like people have that connected in their minds sometimes and as a scientist, you know, I was trained like, no, no, the hole in the ozone layer is about ultraviolet rays, it's not about climate change. That's not true actually. It turns out that the chemicals that are used as propellants like CFCs are not only ozone depleters, they're powerful greenhouse gases. And just a couple of years ago, there was a study that came out that showed that if we had not ratified the Montreal Protocol in the 90s, we would be about one to two degrees warmer today than we, than we are now. That is how much of a big of a difference that that made at the time, right? So, you know, that's a climate win, and we don't hear about it, right? So our, our activism, our efforts, our engagement on environmental issues do matter and can make a difference. And we would be looking at a very different world right now if that had not happened. We didn't know that at the time, but it's one of those things that I, I, I've started looking at. How did we get that to work? How did we get everyone together? Uh, because I feel like the past, again, is a roadmap for you know, inspiration for how we move into the future. So sorry for that kind of messy side note, but it's important. So one thing that's really important to remember is you know we talked about this range of potential futures, and I mentioned that that XKCD cartoon is now out of date. Um, and a couple of years ago, there was a paper that came out that showed us that the worst case climate projections are now no longer guaranteed, right? In fact, RCP 8.5, which people often talk about as business as usual, which is a, a, another misnomer, but that's another talk for another day. Uh, that's the worst case scenario. 
with no policy at all, we have eliminated that, right, from our likely projections. The most likely projections are somewhere between two and a half and three degrees, which are not great. But they're a lot better than four, and they're a lot better than five. We've also rejected the, the, the least uh, harmful uh, future, 1.5. We're probably going to, to pass that. But thanks to a lot of things that we could not predict, we are now, we have basically constrained our possible climate futures and eliminated some of the worst case ones. And that comes out of a faster than predicted growth in green energy, right? That was not predicted to be adopted as quickly as it has been. And I know it feels slow. I know it feels slow. It is too slow. But it is faster than the social science scientists, you know, 10, 15 years ago thought it would happen. And coal has collapsed faster than predicted, right? So the work that you are doing matters. It's making a difference. And I know it doesn't, you can't always see it and it doesn't always feel like it, but it, it's true, it, is, it does matter. And I love, uh, Mary Anais Heglar is one of my favorite climate writers. And she says, I've never seen a perfect world, I never will. But I know that a world warmed by two degrees Celsius is far preferable than to one warmed by three degrees or six, and that I'm willing to fight for it with everything I have because it's everything I have. I don't need a guarantee of success before I risk everything to save the things, the people, the places that I love before I try to save myself, right? In her essay, home is always worth it. And so to me, home is always worth it, right? So rejecting that certainty, that, that unwarranted certainty about a future climate apocalypse, uh, you know, it means committing yourself to doing the work. You may not get to see the end results, but that does not mean you get to not try, right? And so here's where I come back to muskox. I, I, promi I promise you it was coming. So we, this, this metaphor worked a lot better when we used to talk about climate hawks and doves. You remember that? Oh, he's a climate hawk. Well, he's a climate dove. Uh, and I, I was on a podcast with Andy Revkin um, and Eric Holthouse, and Eric was like, I'm a climate hawk, and Andy was like, well, I'm a climate dove. And I was like, this is silly. Uh, I'm a climate muskox. <laughs> and, and they were like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, muskox are one of the few species to survive the wide extinctions we had at the end of the Pleistocene. The mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths, uh, Beavers the size of black bears, um, armadillos the size of VW bugs, all of those wonderful creatures that I will never get to see except in my mind's eye. But muskox are still here, right? They're amazing. They're resilient. They power through the Arctic darkness and cold with just sheer stubbornness. They're also matriarchal. And I think there's something, I think there's something to be said about letting women lead for a while. Uh, I mean, to be, to be fair, guys have had it for 10,000 years. Now it's our turn. We get 10,000 years, and then we can share. Um, no, but in seriousness, uh, muskox are matriarchal. The females decide where the herd goes. They migrate based on the capacity of the land and the needs of the herd, right? They are sustainable through their long inherited knowledge and wisdom. They learn from each other. Woolly mammoths were similar, right? The grandmothers would teach the mothers, the mothers would teach the children. This is where we go, this is how we avoid danger, this is where we eat, this is how we protect each other. So they have culture, right? And that culture is one that has enabled their survival and resilience. And one of my favorite things about muskox is that everything they do operates from a justice framework, right? So when threatened, they surround the vulnerable. So what you're seeing here is a photograph of muskox that are threatened by a predator. So they are circling up with the elderly, the weak, the injured, and the young inside of what I call the circular phalanx of badassery. <laughs> and they put their tough, thick skulls and their horns outward to face the danger. Right? They are not, they're not strangers to loss. Their cousins are gone, right? The mammoths and uh, Ice Age rhinos and an Arctic bison that they once shared the Arctic with are gone. But they have learned what it takes to survive. And they know that giving in is death. So here's how you can be like a climate muskox. You gotta be loud. Tell your climate story. Shout it from the rooftops, don't be quiet. Be brave. Imagine a better future 
and fight for it, right? Be wise. Learn from your elders who have so much to teach us about so many movements and what is effective in our organizing and lift up our youth. Don't just listen to them or cheer them on. Collaborate and conspire with them, right? There's a tremendous amount of energy in our youth climate movement. My generation failed to gain that cohesion and that platform. We can, we can at least uplift them and be on the front lines with them and protect them with our bodies if necessary. Be strong. Embrace collective action. Reject the myths of individualism that got us here in the first, first place. And center climate justice in everything that we do. There is no transition without a just transition. And be stubborn. Reject binary thinking. Practice active hope. And I would say that rejecting the certainty of doomism is not a denial of the reality of the climate crisis, as I am often told by people who are just so wrapped up in their pain and their trauma that they cannot see a way forward. Think of it instead as an invitation to be a good ancestor. Where would we be today if our own ancestors had not been brave, right? If they had made better choices. And I want to leave you with a part of an essay that I just had published in a collection uh, edited by Rebecca Solna, Solnit and uh, Thelma Young, Latuna Tubois. What could we accomplish if we stood together and faced the danger? What seeds might we plant that will one day take root above our bones? What if the future was better than the past? What if it was beautiful? So I invite you to think about that because we can't, we can't move towards a better future unless we know what we're moving towards. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with some questions for the breakout session. How do we validate our emotional responses to the climate crisis without giving in to defeat of, defeatism, doomism, or despair? What, what can we do to partner with artists to envision better climate futures that we can fight for? We have to have a roadmap. We have to be moving towards something. And how can we provide people, just everyday folks who just want to help, how can we provide them with better pathways toward collective action? So with that, I want to thank you for being part of this herd, and I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks. Thanks.